excellent. Uh, so we've got three fantastic screenwriters here today. And obviously uh, for everybody watching, uh, just if you have any questions throughout the discussion, feel free to hop on the group chat and type your questions in and we will be um, checking them throughout, throughout the talk. Um, so yeah, let's uh, get started. I mean, screenwriter, oh, sorry, let me, let me introduce everybody. <laughs> We've got Dan Petrie Jr. He's the screenwriter of Hi. Beverly Hills Cop, The Big Easy, Toy Soldiers, created the show Combat Hospital. We have Robert Nelson Jacobs. He's a screenwriter of Chocolat, The Shipping News, Out to Sea. We have Tom Shulman, the screenwriter of Dead Poet Society, also an Oscar winner. I wrote, he also wrote What About Bob, Eight Heads in a Duffel Bag, Honey, I've Shrunk the Kids. These three have a tremendous amount of knowledge um, and insight for you guys. And yeah, let's start with how, what's your workspace like? <laughs> Screenwriters work from home all the time. You know, what are your essentials? What do you have to have around you um, to, to start writing? <laughs> Lots of hot tea. Well, you see it, you know, uh, the, uh, a laptop, uh, a uh, computer monitor, and uh, uh, tools of distraction. Uh, I mean, plus I see an old man back there, Dan. Is that, uh, <laughs> is that you using that still? Pardon me? Are you using that manual typewriter back there behind you? Oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> All the time. No. <laughs> right. Uh, but I like it. For me, I, it used to be that I, I, I needed a very quiet, small room. And then lately I've found that I'm sort of okay anywhere as long as I don't get too interested in the, interested in the conversation that, that uh, is, is going on around me. So I sort of like going to coffee shops and libraries and, you know, things like that. The, the walks between places do me good. So, mm -hmm. um, but I have, a, I have an office which is small and I like it that way. I find during this period of time that, I mean, I have an office in the house. And you can see on the wall, I've got these antique maps that distract me and take my imagination far away. But I also, in this period of time, when we're all so confined, I'm using lots of different rooms in the house in a way that I don't normally, just so that I can vary my work environment throughout the day. Yeah. I find that I can avoid work in just about any space. Around. <laughs> it's a gift, huh? <laughs> Thanks. Do you have any rituals? Any, do you have music that you listen to? Um, any, anything that's just kind of get your wheels turning, regardless of whether you're working on something, a specific project? When you say rituals, I think of sacrificing a virgin in a volcano. <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, if it gets <laughs> wheels turning. For me, it's cleaning. I like to do, you know, everything has to be cleaned. I mean, I, I, you can even clean a paper clip I've found, and that's, that's the kind of, clean that I like my office before I start. Um, I, I know that some writers like to listen to music and, and program different kinds of music depending on what they're writing. I can't have music anywhere near me when I'm writing. I like it too much and I'm interested in it too much and it, it just distracts me. Yep. Um, I also, my ritual has always been, ever since I was a little kid, to start working very early, that I'll wake up and, and you know get something to eat quickly and then just get right to work. Um, you know, I'll work for an hour or two before I take a shower and start the day. And that's, for me, that's the best time. So the closer I am to the unconscious time of sleep, the, the better I write. Yeah. I tend to write later in the day because I procrastinate. Uh, and it's only when I feel uh, a tremendous stab of guilt that I really get started. I'm with you there, Dan. That's exactly what I do. I get up every morning and I'm ready to write by nine and I start writing by two. And it's yeah. just, and of course, all these new, I want to say, but the internet and the cell phone and texting, and 
you know, social media is just, I, I've become so filled with, with ADD now. It's incredible. It's just mm -hmm. so easy to get distracted and stop writing. How do you stay focused then? Me? Yeah. I, I wouldn't call it focus. I mean, I, I think, you know, in the same way that when you're twisting a camera lens, you're in and out of focus all the time, maybe only a tenth of the time are you actually in focus. I actually feel that's the way I, my brain is working now just very little focus, it's, it's amazing. I used to be able to do concentrated writing, I, I think for 15 or 16 hours a day, just every waking minute. And I, I don't, I'd hate to try to do that now. So I find, and I don't know you guys, I'm interested to know if you guys find this as well, that it really depends on what stage of a project that I'm in. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure out the idea. If I'm still kind of in the dark, uh, and kind of looking for my way around, I can't work for very long at a time. I have to get up and do something. I'll pick lint off the carpet. I'll look for anything to do besides work. And my wife refers to that as the torture chamber. Mm -hmm. She stays away from me as much as possible during that, during that time. Once I have an outline, once I feel secure in the outline and have a story, then I can work for long stretches and time moves very quickly and I look up and realize the day is over. So it really depends on what phase of the project I'm in. Yeah, please That's share how, how your outline process. How do each of you outline? Uh, Dan, I think, were you going to say something? Well, yes. I, uh, uh, but that an to answer that question, I am like you in the outlining process. Very, uh, uh, I need to go take a shower because uh, so many uh, ideas come to you while you're in the shower. Uh, so I get very clean. The, uh, the outlining process and the writing process are very different. I believe in outlining. Uh, if nothing else, uh, you can, when you lose your confidence in, in what you're writing, which inevitably happens to me, uh, you can say, all right, I'll just follow the outline and do that and then if it turns out to be terrible uh, no harm done we'll, we'll throw it away but usually i regain my conscious uh, uh uh my uh uh confidence in that in that struggle uh and the outline has uh has saved me as it so often does i'll tell you what what i think the best outlining process I ever did was, I, I rarely do it because frankly, I think I've gotten lazy. But in the old days, right, right after computers were sort of became one of the, the tools I used, I, every time I had an idea for a particular story, I'd just write it down in, in, that, in that story's file. And after a while, I'd, I would realize, okay, I know, the, I know the whole story now and I have enough material. I might have 200 pages of notes in that file, a lot of them redundant, a lot of them terrible. But I would I would go through and cut every one of those, put them, put them all in bunches, cut those notes into strips, keeping each idea together, stack them in a pile, clear off the floor, maybe a six by 10 space on the floor, and then just start putting those, pick up the first one and go, okay, this is an act one note, divide them into the three acts, and then start placing them on the floor like a, almost like people like used to put cards up on the on the uh, uh, on these uh, yeah. and I, that I would go oh I know scene one and I know scene three I don't know how to connect them but I'm not going to worry about it right now all I'm going to do is just keep picking up these notes and putting placing them where I think they should go and while I was doing that it's like you and the sh that, that's my way of going to the shower I might be putting a note down right. on the far right hand corner of the floor and all of a sudden I'd go, I know how to connect those two scenes. And then I'd type that thing out and put it between them. And that process of sort of just consciously putting it all out while you let your unconscious work was uh, really worked well for me. And then when I had all those strips in order, I'd tape them into onto eight by 10 pieces of paper, three hole punch the paper, put them in a notebook. And that notebook was my outline. And I'd sit down and I'd open it up and look at page one. And it was basically an instruction guide for the entire script That's and great. write the script from there. That's great. I'll tell you another, another trick that I stumbled onto at some point. Um, 
which is when I get stuck, if I'm, if I'm really blocked, if I've got sort of parts of the outline and can't, and just feel like I can't go on, the story's not working. Um, I will, um, and, and I don't do this very often because it's very painful, but if I'm really stuck, I will sit down and write, and on a yellow pad, I will write down everything I hate about the story. <laughs> and right. and it, it's very therapeutic. You know, I hate this, this is shit, blah, 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 blah. And in the process of saying what I hate, often I find myself saying what I wish the story could be. Mm. And then I realize, oh, wait, I'm in the court story could be that. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. But you really have to be willing to go to that dark place and say, oh, because so much of our time is spent trying to give ourselves confidence because we're all so scared. And you have to be willing to say, okay, I'm just gonna let it all rip. I'm gonna, just gonna let it all fly. And when I do that, more often than not, it leads me someplace where I can start again. That's great, love that. I, I write outlines uh, the, uh, I don't know if this is the old fashioned way or the new fashioned way, but I, I write school child uh, outlines with, with uh, the equivalent of uh, the big one and then the uh, Roman numeral one and then A and then B, C, uh, and then indented a, a, across the page until even dialogue could be included, uh, but I can always go back with the Microsoft Word outlining program uh, to just see the the headlines, just see uh, uh, the A B C, the big letter A B C, and what act it is. Uh, I find that very useful to hide the hide the forest and hide the trees so you can see the forest. What, what program do you use? Is that just my, is there a, a that's, Microsoft that's, a, that's in Microsoft Word, but now some of the uh, screenwriting programs are starting to do outlines that way. Mm -hmm. uh, um, Writer Duet, which I have uh, used more recently, uh, does that. Final draft does it in a sort of. Mm -hmm. Okay. When you guys do rewrites, there's a question from Kay Barnes in, um, right now. She's asking, uh, do you go all the way back to adjust the outline as well, or do you just start at act one? Um, I find, I, I used to, it, it sort of depends on the rewrite. I mean, if it's just sort of a polish and you know, and it's a, a tar targeted thing, you know where the problems are, you know, I'll just go in and make those fixes. But oftentimes, um, I will force myself to go back to the outline. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I will even sometimes look at the script and make a new outline based on the latest version of the script and just scene by scene. And in doing that, in just the process of recreating the outline, you make discoveries. You go, oh, wait a minute, this doesn't work anymore with what I'm trying to do. And I just find the more I can force myself to, stay, to, to be at the outline stage, the more efficient the writing will be. I think that's exactly right. I'm, I'm re rewriting something right now, which I thought I had a few weeks to do. Maybe I have a year now, who knows? <laughs> but, uh, and that, you know, it just felt like going back to the outline was the most efficient and, and, and most creative way to approach it because it's a reconceptualization of the, the story. So uh, that's a, that's, I think that's a, the, the way to do it. I go back to the outline too, and I think it's because no outline really survives the first draft. Uh, always when you're in the process of writing the first draft, things have to be, things have to be changed. Very often I've in, I, I realize when I'm writing the draft that I've included too much in the outline and I need to uh, uh, truncate things. Well, that doesn't always work. So going, going back to an outline stage before launching into the second draft is probably something I use about half the time. Uh, uh, it's important. The other thing the outline helps you do, going back to the outline, is it helps you kill your darlings. And then we all have those moments and, and jokes and favorite lines. And yes. if you're working on the script, it's hard to let go. If you're, if you're taking the macro view and seeing how everything is supposed to fit together, I think it's a little easier to let go of the things that you 
love but may not be serving the story. Uh, we have sure. Another question here. How do you know when your idea is strong enough to develop into a screenplay? Asks Claudia. Wow, that's a good question. Uh, very, uh, my, my friends, uh, um, Scott Moore and, and uh, well, the writers of Hangover, uh, uh, say that getting an idea is, uh, they can write every day, but getting an idea that's good enough for a feature film, they, they come up with one a year. Uh, it's, it's very hard uh, knowing whether your uh, story is strong enough. Uh, usually, uh, for me, I have to have some sense of delight, some sense of, oh, this is, this is cool, or this is funny, or this will, this will work, this will have enough uh, um, before I can commit to it. I once heard Paul, the writer Paul Schrader ask this question. He was on a panel, and Paul wrote Taxi Driver many other things and uh he said that that you should tell your story to to anyone you trust many people that you trust he said if you tell it 10 times you should see or hear an oh wow from the other person when they hear what you're what you're the this, this story and if nine out of ten you get an oh wow either visually or verbally then you know you've got something pretty good the other the other benefit of telling it to other people is you get their reaction but you also get the benefit of your internal reaction as you're telling it and you can you can feel where the weak parts are you can feel where you're hurrying over something you know where you're skipping something because it doesn't work right. or where you're you're uncertain or you just you just know that it's not going to hit right yeah that you're you're getting the benefit of their feedback and you're also getting the benefit of your stage fright as you're as you're pitching it <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> now you all are ha, are so great at creating memorable characters. How do you approach characters? I mean, I think you you sort of know when you have. I mean, I, I approach my characters because I try to, in some way. I mean, once I understand the function of a character in a story, and sometimes the story will start with the character, and other times I think I have a, a good idea for a plot. But once I start to people the plot with characters, I try to uh, sort of cast it with people I know from and you know, good characters and people who I know what they would do in those particular circumstances. Even though they may not have ever been in those circumstances, I, I, I feel like they would behave in a funny way or a really interesting way or something that makes me think that's the right person to put in the role. And from that point on, I sort of have the benefit of their imagination, my imagination about what I think they would do, and then the characters, the circumstances of the character. But uh, so that that gives me, I think, extra dimensions on the for, with those characters. When you say you you think of uh, uh, actual people, to do you mean actors or do you mean no, just no. real people that you know? I don't, I never use actors because I feel like I don't know them, but I, I try to use, I mean, if I need someone, you know, who, who really say screwed somebody over and that's what they're going to do. I, yeah. I know people who have done that and I, I'll try to sort of find someone who I think either has done it or could have done it and I'll, and it'll be a real person. Might've been somebody I knew in the third grade. It might be somebody I know now, but that I'll sort of, Usually I just make a pretty quick judgment about who that is and then stick them in there and stick them in the story and see what happens. Yes. Yeah. I find also that, you know, oftentimes I'll start from premise. I mean, I have an idea and, and sort of the minimum that I need is I need to know who the main character is. I need to know what that person wants. I need to know what's keeping them from getting it. And if I know that, then I can start to construct that character. And then, and then once you've got that, then you can start to construct other characters who are going to feed that character, either going to get in that character's way or help that character or fall in love with that character or, you know, whatever. But it starts from sort of that basic idea of who's the main person? What are they, 
yearn for? What do they need? What's their goal? And what's, what's going to get in the way? Yeah, and talking about uh, supporting characters too, I think, you know, sometimes you can have so many, like how, how do you rein it in? How do you judge who will be important um, and what that relationship would be like with your protagonist or, you know, or the antagonist? Like how do you, yeah, how, how do you determine who who's important? Uh, I'm not sure you know at the beginning. I mean, a lot of times I think somebody's important and then find out they're not. I mean, mm -hmm. so much of it is is discovering what you need to move the story forward. Mm -hmm. um, and again, as I was saying about you know good lines, sometimes you also have to kill off your favorite characters because they're not they're not feeding the story. That's right. That's right. I think you. I mean, I think you you mentioned the antagonist. I mean, we all know that's. An incredibly important character in the story. I mean, the better the antagonist, the yeah. the, the stronger your protagonist has to be. So you know, those two are key. And then you know, every other character sort of circles those two like like planets in a solar system, and they have their varying roles in the story. And after a while, you you you'll realize which one of those you know, perform the most important functions in the story, and try to you know winnow it down to the to the, the fewest that you need. Yeah, I think antagonist is a good one. I always prefer the word antagonist to the word villain mm -hmm. um, because you want, you know, a strong antagonist. It means someone who's powerful, but also means someone who's interesting and someone who's got a point of view. And like, you know, like in Shakespeare plays, he often gives the best speeches to the, to the antagonist. You know, Iago has great speeches, you know. Um, and so you want, you want that character to be more than functional. You want that antagonist to have his or her own reasons for doing what they're doing and they need to be interesting. Yeah, often they're more interesting than okay. at, at, uh, at least some stages uh, than, than the uh, protagonist is. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to, uh, uh, someone said, uh, and I can't remember who I'm embarrassed to say, said that the antagonist or the, the villain is the hero of his own movie. Yes. Uh, yes. And do you remember who that was? But I, th yeah, oh, I, I, I said, I said that <laughs> I'm kidding. No doubt. <laughs> uh, no, but it's true. And, and actors don't like to think of themselves, the antagonist, who play antagonists don't like to think of themselves as villains. They think their story is, somebody was telling me that they saw Dustin Hoffman in the first play he did in New York. And he had a three minute scene where he was an accountant helping the main character figure out some of his tasks. And she knew Dustin and she said to him afterwards, I, you know, I, I love your character. And he goes, well, that's, what, that's who the play's about. The play's about me, it's about this guy. <laughs> and he was serious, he had made the whole, filled it in by making the whole play about the, how this accountant is helping this character, you That's know? Right. It's, I think that level of specificity and detail, you know, as writers, that's what we need to do too. Yeah. Without having them swallow up our whole, our whole, our whole story. Yeah. Uh, an actor allegedly said that uh, uh, his play was about uh, a uh, ambulance attendant taking a older lady to the hospital. It was, uh, uh, of course, Streetcar Named Desire. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, and by the way, um, you know, if you're fortunate enough to get to the point where the movie's gonna, gonna shoot, um, and they bring actors in, the actors will ask you all kinds of questions, and, and some of them you can answer, and some of them they ask the question, you go, oh, yeah, um, and they make you fill in backstory that you weren't that you didn't really know yet. I mean, they will ask you because each because each actor sees the sees the story as the story of that character, and they will. Yes. Uh, you know, you're you're looking at the whole thing. You're sort of trying to manage the whole thing. They're, they've got one assignment, and they will they will keep you honest about that character. That was but, my question: was whether you know? I know TV definitely you have to kind of create and cultivate a backstory for, for every character. But in features, is that more is that common as well to create an entire backstory for the main characters? It's it's useful to do so, and and as I say, if you if you leave some holes, the actors will find them, and they will, for you know, sure, they'll, they'll make you fill it in. Yeah, yeah. And then the question, the only way out of that is to say to them, well, what do you think? 
<laughs> yeah, and and usually they will tell you. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> right. Sometimes that's very helpful, and sometimes they'll come to you with a cockamamie theory. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. They will. Or they may think they need another writer. <laughs> that's, yeah. They might, you might have to say, well, if we do that, then Act 3 doesn't really make sense. So let's think about that a little bit more. But I like the direction of what you're doing. Right. <laughs> we have a question from Reginald Bullock. How did you find your writing voice? Wow. Hmm. I don't know. I think, I think my voice found me. I don't know that it's something you can pursue. I think you, I think you sort of pursue the craft and try to try to build something according to the building blocks of the craft. And the voice is something that hopefully you discover. I think mm -hmm. that's right. You just, I think the more you write, the more you find your own voice and you probably don't know. Some people seem to know right away. And, uh, but, but uh, others who are called writing and, but don't know the voice, I think, uh, what their voice is. I think once you write, a, start writing and write a lot, you'll know. And your voice is sort of, the, the, your, your sort of moral code is, is rippling through everything you're doing. You're always making decisions about whether something a character does is appropriate or inappropriate and how other characters are gonna feel about them, how you feel about them, how the audience is gonna feel about them. All those things are, are part of your voice. So, you know, cause everybody's gonna have a different take on that. So your sort of strength and feeling, what you feel about all those things will start to come across the more you do it. Yeah, I think that that's really good because you, know, you talk about choices that character make, characters make. I find, another thing that I find if I'm getting stuck or if I'm feeling like a script isn't working, is I will look at the choices that a character has to make, particularly big moral choices that a character has to make because those are really what the story's about. Those are the things that reveal the meaning of the story. So that's another kind of trick if you're feeling stuck. Um, you know, you know, not necessarily looking at speeches or looking at the way the character is talking, but looking at those choices, the moral choices that the character is making. And they have to, be, again, they have to be interesting and they have to be non-obvious. You know, we have to kind of not know what choice the character is going to make because that's what reveals character. That's right. Can you guys talk about your experience uh, writing screenplays that are adapted from um, another source or IP? The best uh, advice I ever heard about adapting was, was from Anthony Minghella talking about adapting the English patient. And he said, you know, I, I devoured the book. I made copious notes on the book. I underlined. I, you know, made my own sort of treatment. I did all, all this stuff. He said, and then I took the book. I put the book in a drawer in my desk and locked the drawer. Wow. Which for me is a metaphor for what the adaptation process is, that you, that you live with it, that you, that you, you analyze it, you, you, you discover what's bothering you about it, you discover what you love about it, and then you put it away and then you, and you make it your own. And you do your own outline and you make it a, a different animal because what works in a book, even a wonderful book, may not work cinematically. So you have to you, you know, absorb it, internalize it, and then, and then sort of completely rebuild it in, in the language of movies. Yeah, books often, uh you read the first hundred pages and it's wonderful about the characters and we understand uh, the people so well. And you realize that none of that can, the story hasn't really started yet. Yes. Uh, or, the, or the movie story. Uh, whereas movies uh, and television, uh, they're so different. They're, they're, uh, uh, they're very structured, whereas novels are are not necessarily uh, uh, structured. In, in and if they are structured, they're not structured in the same way. Uh, so uh, I like that. I'm going to do that next time. Put the put the um, put the book in the drawer after uh, uh, digesting it, because that's I guess what you have to do. I also, I like what you said, Dan, about the first hundred pages because, um, you know, yeah, the structure of books is so much looser and sometimes I'll, I'll be reading a book, you know, with an eye to adapting and I'm halfway through the book and my wife says, how is it? I said, it's pretty good, but I haven't gotten to the end of Act One yet. Yes, exactly. 
how do you choose what um, what to include in the screenplay when working off a book? Well, again, I think it's that process of. of I've never done an adaptation, so I don't. I don't know. Sorry. Yeah, I was going to say. I mean, it's a little bit like Tom the process you were describing of laying everything out on the floor. I mean, you know, you sort of write down everything that you like about the book. You know, all the moments that may or may not work in a movie, but that but that sort of spoke to you. Um, um, and also what you didn't, what, what bothered you about the book? Um, mm -hmm. you know, didn't seem dramatic. I mean, some books, uh, you know, they don't necessarily have a dramatic structure like a, like a play would have. Um, and so you, you sort of grab those things that, that, that grabbed you, kind of lay them out. And then, you know, it's a little bit like Tom was saying, where you look at, you know, at, at scene one and scene three, and then you discover what needs to be scene two. Mm -hmm. If you do that with pieces of a book, you're almost like, you're almost like using the part, the things in the book that you like as pieces of a puzzle, and then you have to fill in the other pieces. You have to sort of, sort of create a picture, a new picture. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, we have a question from Maylin too. Is it hard to switch between writing comedy and writing drama? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hard. Well, it depends on the idea. It depends on your your uh, 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 your your sense of the uh, of the story. If it lends itself to comedy, uh, then it's easy to write in that way. Uh, if it if it doesn't, you're writing a drama. <laughs> or if you're if you're like me and and do action comedy or something all, always comedy slash something uh, or something slash comedy is because uh, uh, I'm not that funny. So uh, I need the crutch of being able to say, uh, oh, well, this isn't funny. Good. This is the, this is the drama part or this is the action part. And it's not meant to be. Yeah, I, f I find that the a comedy idea is sort of the gift that keeps on giving. And if it does, it'll get you through the whole story and the whole screenplay. And if not, if it, you know, peters out a third or two thirds of the way through, then you're, then you're, then you're lost. So, um, you know, I, I'm kind of with Dan on that. If it's, if it's not going to be funny enough, it's a drama. Although if you have an action piece, you might be able to squeeze enough comedy in to keep, keep both those yeah. balls in the air. Uh, yeah. But I think that, and I find that, you know, you don't really have to be that funny if your characters are funny in mm -hmm. the sense that they'll, they'll just with them. Finds it being clever or more pointed or whatever than than you might be in life, but they can be that way on the page, and you can be that way on the page when you might not be that way in a room with people. Yeah, there are certain characters that you that you kind of love because you realize they're full of snappy dialogue, and, and it's like I, you always want to come back to that character. They're going to kind of save you. Um, right. I actually want to come back. I want to go back a step to to the adaptation question because another thing occurred to me, which is which I found very useful which is that if I'm adapting a book, and even if the book is, is well-researched, I always do my own research as well. Um, and it's part of what allows me to make it my own. I mean, for example, um, when I was writing Chocolat, um, you know, the, the book, in the book, the character of Vian is sort of a, you know, it's, it's similar in that she's kind of a traveling healer, but in that book, she was more just sort of a witch. And I started doing my own research about chocolate and found out all this sort of great stuff about how the Mayans considered chocolate sacred, and you know they sort of kept it in repositories like Fort Knox. You know, it was like the sacred thing, and and, I, and it sort of it 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 created. My wife does the same thing, though. Yeah. So yeah, it, it created a whole mythology for me about chocolate, and and it, and it gave me a a dimension and a texture to the character of Vian that, that that wasn't there yet for me, and that was based on my own research. Um, and then when I <laughs> The first time I met the writer of the book, it was at the it was at the New York premiere of the movie, and and I sat very nervously behind her as we watched the movie, uh, and when it was all done, I said, "So, so what did you think?" She paused a moment. She's very British, and she said, "Where did all that Mayan stuff come from?" 
<laughs> and I started to hesitate and and stutter and blabber out an answer. And when it was all done, she said, damn, I wish I'd thought of it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Which, which to me, the lesson was, you know, the book is not sacred. The book is something that you take and make your own. And if you honor the spirit of the book, maybe you find something new that, you know, enhances it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And, and speaking of that, like, are there any writing rules that you love to break? You know, I think a lot of times, you know, everyone talks about the three act structure and like there, are, there's a formula to, to, to write a screenplay, but not all great screenplays have to follow this strict formula. Are there, are there any, you know, I guess rules that you often break and find that, hey, it's okay. It's still, <laughs> the story still, and the screenplay still good and works. Well, you know, I don't think that there's any formula, but I'm a big believer in the three act structure, just because a movie has to have a beginning and a middle and an end. Uh, and that's all it is, uh, the, except there are certain characteristics of the, of the beginning. Uh, it's setting up the characters and the essential situation, the conflict that uh, uh, tells us, uh, uh, that sets the stage for the rest of the story. So the rest of the story is the middle uh, until you come to a point at the end of the middle, if you will, uh, where uh, everything, uh, that our hero has tried to do uh, is defeated by the antagonist or uh, circumstance, uh, if, if it's that kind of story. And then uh, from this point, you tell the ending. What, what happens as a result of this, of this failure? Uh, that is not a formula it's in my view uh it's it you can do anything uh with that i mean i think you want to be as creative as i agree with you dan and you want to be as creative as possible about telling your story in the in the most creative way because that's going to make it interesting and dynamic and different you know and if, you, if you're copying a three strike structure deliberately then you're probably got some kind of plotting story. I mean, you always want your story to, to, to just be a, a great story. And you can tell it any way you want. I mean, I always felt when I was younger, I always thought I, I, I really want every story I'm writing to try to break all the rules, particularly in the first act, you know, just to, to sort of loosen it up and keep it, keep it interesting. And then, you know, eventually you, you have to come back to the, what, what Dan's talking about. You've got, a, got a, a protagonist who gets defeated and how are they going to come back from this? It, it, seem, it should seem impossible at the end of, of the second act. It should feel like there's just no hope. They, they've lost. Story's over. This is going to be a bad movie. And then somehow, miraculously, they dig deep. They find their way through and in a way that no one's ever thought of or no one in the audience could ever think of. They thought of it. And it's, it's a miracle. So then it becomes a, a great story, you hope. You know, the, the three-act structure is there to help us. It's not there to, it's not there to, to sort of hem us it in. Rule or us, it. yeah. It's, it's, there to, it's there to aid us. And I really think that the that three-act structure is kind of, that our brains are wired for, for three parts. And I've actually talked to friends of mine in other arts. I mean, I, I talked to a musician friend of mine and said, is there any, you know, what's the three-part thing? He said, oh yeah, it's a sonata. And I said, what are the parts of the sonata? And he said, exposition, development, and recapitulation. That's a screenplay. <laughs> yeah. You know, you set up a question, you develop it, and then you answer the question. And, and a friend of mine is a sculptor. I said, so what's, this, what's the three parts? He said, oh yeah, three parts. It's the, it's the head, the body, and the pedestal. Um, you know, it's just, you know, every art form sort of has its version of three acts. And we should probably point out that the greatest writer who ever lived, Shakespeare, wrote five act structure. Right. So. Uh, go <laughs> not. Go Maybe, not. Yeah. But what did he know? Uh, let's talk a bit about the the industry, you know, writing features, pitching features, 
um, as we talked earlier, you know, it's, it's evolved <laughs> in the last few decades, you know, what's been your experience like with pitching and selling original features, you know, is it still possible to make a living writing features? <laughs> wow. <laughs> I know. Big question. It depends, it depends on the kind of features you're writing. I mean, I think that, that you know, clearly the, the major studios are looking to, to make movies that are either sequels or about, you know, people, uh, characters in, with capes. And, it's, and they, they are developing IP, they like to call it, um, that, that they own already, that already has value because it's already shown in the marketplace that, that people like it and want to see it, would like to see a movie about it. So it's very hard to, to and, and those are basically the kind of movies they want to do, franchise movies. So uh, you have to think that what you're doing, if you want to go to a studio, is, is one of those franchises but and either you own the under which would be very unusual because I think that the studios have already bought just about everything they can think of, but or that's that's out there that's been successful. So you have to come up with something for them that's that's IP feels like something they would buy if it were already popular uh, in in that kind of world. But then there's a whole independent world where it's sort of like the movies were 10, 15 years ago. Uh, and in that world, uh, it's easier. There's no money in it, but it's easier. So can't make a living there, but you can, you can, you can make something you love. Yeah, I mean, I find that um, the kinds of movies that I, sort of you know made my career with are harder and harder to make i mean the kind of the kind of mid-budget drama with a little comedy in it is very hard to get made i mean uh, um but it's not impossible i mean there you just have to sort of work harder and you know, like the indie world that tom is talking about you sort of find that producer who's got a little discretionary fund somebody who's got some money to spend I mean, you're not going to make a fortune that way but you can still sort of pitch those modest dramas that i happen to love um, and, and, you know, if you can get it made, it's still going to be really fun to see it on the screen, but it's just harder. It's just much harder. We have a question from Nicholas Brandt. How do you prepare for pitches? Valium. Valium. <laughs> practice, practice, practice. I mean, I will, I will tell that pitch, uh, to as many people who will listen. I'll tell it to myself in front of the mirror. And again, it's that thing we were talking about earlier where I can tell from their reaction, but I can also tell from, from how I'm feeling, so where the weak spots are. And by the time I go into the room to pitch, hopefully I've pitched a lot of times. Uh, I pitch worse than anybody in Hollywood. Uh, I say that with uh, no apology. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, uh, when, when the late Alvin Sargent was uh, was alive, though, I learned that he was worse than me. He would start <laughs> worse than me. He, he would start pitches by saying, "Well, this might not work, but <laughs> and I'm not not that bad." Uh, but I've I've found that I'm pitching less. Uh, and writing more, uh, just, uh, and writing more, just because you, you, it's 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 so hard unless you have a built-in uh, 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 audience uh, when to to pitch something. Uh, you know, it it uh, the buyers aren't aren't there as opposed to uh, avenues to get the movie made. That's sometimes uh, this. When there's no, no one sometimes. who really is lining up to, to pay for development. Right. I mean, most, peop most people will tell you there's very little money out there for development. You can go pitch a story to a producer you know, whose, whose office is a castle 
and then they'll tell you, you know, we, don't, we love that story, go write it, and please bring it to us because we don't have any development. Please bring it to us. Do you create um, pitch docs? Any just kind of written things either for yourself or that you bring with you? Written things either for yourself or for me? For myself, definitely. I, it's all, you know, it's yeah. just, it's a bunch of bullet points, but it's basically a script that I have mostly memorized, but I'm using that as my kind of guide. Um, and you try to make, and I'm trying to sound very spontaneous, it's completely rehearsed, um, but I'll sort of act like, like something just to kind of bring the next, even though it's part of the script. Yeah, I think I, I, I completely figure out everything, tell it to 20 people before I go to pitch it. If I'm pitching to several people before I go to pitch it, it'll get better as I do, you know, with each buyer because I just get yeah. looser and more relaxed. And, and, uh, and I never leave anything behind. And the, I, the, oftentimes, if you're not pitching to the decision maker, though, you're relying on the pitching skills of the person that you pitched to. To pitch to the boss. So some people will say have a lead behind just to make sure your story gets you know the, the way you'd like your story told. Because I pitch so badly, I write everything out, and uh, and so I could leave it out, but I I theatrically. Uh, uh, make notes all over it uh, so that the pages that I'm pitching from uh, look obviously disfigured. You know, I've got underlinings or question marks or what, what have you. So when somebody asks for something, can you leave that behind? Oh no, it's so messy, but I'll get back to you, you know, and then I can decide whether to send them something or not. You know, I can decide whether to spend them. Never leave it behind right then. Right. Uh, we have a question for Bob. Specifically. Yeah. A question for Bob and Jay. Can I, can I do one more thing first? I just uh, wanted to add one thing. Oh, yeah, go for it. Yeah, go for it. I just want to say about pitching that, you know, you've got your spiel for them, but the another really good trick, I think, I think when you finish pitching, when they react to the pitch, take copious notes, even if you don't like what they're saying. Because part of the pitch is getting them to listen to you, but you're showing that you're listening to them. And that's a really good thing to remember. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, so the question for you was, how much should getting your mask help you? Hmm. And would you suggest that? Um, How do you suggest that? Uh, the, the getting uh, you cut out a little bit. This is a question about the Iowa Writers Workshop. Was that? Was yes, that right? exactly. Sorry about that. How much did? Yeah. Uh, getting exactly. Sorry about that. It was. A, it was a great place to spend two years. Um, the great advantage for me of the of the MFA program in Iowa was that um, it allowed me to write and. And my parents asked me to get a job. Um, and there were also many wonderful writers who came and did workshops. And, you know, and you learn a lot. You know, learn a lot of doing and listening to doing workshops and having people like, uh, uh, you know, Joyce Carol Oates and John Cheever and my teacher all year. And, you know, you just learn a lot from just hanging out with those people. Um, I came then came to Hollywood with a very cavalier attitude, saying, "Well, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I couldn't have been more wrong." I then had to I then had to learn an entirely new skill. Um, it's a related skill. It's like the different. You have, to, you have to both involve music, but it's a completely different technique. Um, and I was humbled when I came to Hollywood to to realize that I had to learn. Oh, I think we had some sound hiccups. You yep. know, is it just me or or is everybody having <laughs> some sound issues? Yeah, I think we're getting some connection. Yeah. Uh, How about now? 
you guys hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you fine. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Um, um, I guess uh, one question I had was, you know, what are kind of the must read screenplays? Like when you're, when somebody's studying how to write a screenplay or, you know, screenplays that you continue to go back to, to kind of help you write, what are some of those uh, screenplays for you? Wow. Chinatown has to be high on the list. Yeah. Uh, Groundhog Day, Casablanca, Star Wars. I mean, any, any movies that you like should be the sc screenplays that you read, I think. You know, you sort of, because they give you insight into how, how what's, what's going on, what, what went on behind the scenes. So, um, but I, I, you know, I feel like the ones that, that I'm going to mention are, you know, from the Jurassic period. So, and, and so. And no, so. please mention did, it. Did we lose Robert? Yeah, I think we lost Bob, maybe his connection. Mm. We'll come back. Um, for me, Casablanca is sort of the perfect screen play. Uh, so, uh, but uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid was great. Uh, at, at, um, uh, at USC, they said that uh, Princess Bride, they handed out Princess Bride and said, this is an example of a book that cannot be adapted. And so reading the screenplay and for Princess Bride, and which a movie I love, it was always a good one. Um, anything Kurosawa did, either co-wrote or directed, all great movies. Get the English translations. Mm -hmm. But I would say movies that you love. Uh, we have another question here. Um, can you tell us how you got your first chance to pitch from Mary Lynn? Mm -hmm. Well, people, uh, it's, I had to sell something first. Uh, I think that people aren't um, anxious for you to pitch until you're a known quantity as a writer. So it's really all about writing on spec, writing screenplays. Uh, there's uh, once uh, someone's read your screenplay and they don't want, they, they tell you, gee, we don't want to buy that one because of uh, such and such reason, uh, but we're interested in what else you are going to do. That's your opportunity to, to pitch. That's when you're invited. Uh, that's the, um, you should never be in a situation where you ask somebody if they can, if you can pitch to them. Uh, you hope to be in a situation where they've invited you to pitch uh, something. That's easy to say, hard to do, but that is the most practical thing. Yeah, I agree. And I, I, I think that, I mean, I, usually, at least for me, my career started with spec writing and then somehow got agents to read them, got an agent, would go in and sit with the agent while he had sent my spec writing out to see if anyone would buy it. He would ask me, what other ideas you got, kid? I would tell him. And hopefully at some point, and I think the first time I got to pitch, he said, oh my God, I love that idea. I'm going to get you into a meeting at a studio. And, um, and that meeting, I can remember that pitch because it was instructive. He said, do not take any notes in there. Learn your pitch. Tell it and then just sit around and enjoy it for it. I was a nervous wreck, so I put all my ideas on these three by five cards that I put in my pocket. I thought I was going to pitch to one executive at Disney. Turned out there were seven of them there, six of them taking notes, and I was just a nervous wreck. And I kept thinking, I'm not going to take out the cards. I'm not going to take out the cards. Finally, I took out the cards anyway. And when I looked down, I was so nervous, my eyes had dried out and my contacts fell out of my eyes onto the to the uh, to the three by five cards. Oh. And then I looked up and I really see anybody there. 
and it was an, I couldn't read the cards and I couldn't see them. I babbled for 20 minutes and left. So I learned a lot at that pitch. But uh, the point being, I think, is, is back to what Dan said. You, you want to be in that situation where someone wants you to, to go pitch. And it all starts with writing. It all starts with just doing a lot of writing, writing on spec, getting something done that, that friends and other people start to tell you, wow, that's great. And if, if, if people are telling you that, then you take it to the next level. You send it to managers, you send it to agents, anybody who might be able to help it along to, to a buyer. And if those people respond the same way, you, you, you may have something. Tom, was that when you started wearing glasses? <laughs> <Absolutely>. <laughs> Those were back in the days of, of slightly hard, so, I think they were gas permeable, soft contacts. They were a little bit better than the glass, but, but not the, the soft ones. So they were heavy enough to just fall out of your eyes. But yeah, I made adjustments, I'm sure. Well, we have two minutes left and we're gonna, a fun question from Dorothy is, what is your favorite character from your own um, films, and and why are they your fa were they your favorite at, to write? Oh wow, Tom. No, I was gonna say Dan. You go first. Okay. <laughs> uh, wow. Um, I think for me. Uh, uh, I, I have to go with two, uh, Remy and Anne from uh, The Big Easy. Mm. Uh, those, those were my favorite characters to write because they were so different and yet fall in love. And uh, that's what, uh, what I think I did best back in the day. Uh, for me, it would be the Robin Williams character, uh, John Keating from Dead Poet Society. Uh, just a, a great character to write. I really enjoyed writing it. And then uh, probably from what about Pop, again, a character once thought of just was the gift that kept on giving. So he, he was a lot of fun to have around for a few weeks. Can you guys hear me? Oh, yeah, now we can. Yeah. You're back. <laughs> the computer died. I'm now in a different room. <laughs> Reconnected. Great. Uh, so Yay, glad to have you back, Bob. Thank you. Sorry, sorry to have uh, yeah talked for a minute. No worries. Uh, the, the the last question I asked them um, came from in the chat. Dorothy asked, "What who's been your favorite character from your own work to write and why?" Hmm. Um, I think it's a tie between two different movies. I mean, uh, in Chocolat, it's it's um, Juliette Binoche and Alfred Molina. That that sort of relationship, um, which sort of powered the whole story. I just loved it anytime they were together, and and that was fun to write. The other one is just sort of a sentimental favorite, which was Jack Lemmon and Walter Matthau in my first movie, Out to Sea, just because I grew up loving those guys, and I wrote it for them without knowing whether they would be in it, and their voices were in my head. Wow. You know, they just guided me through the whole thing. And that was, it was just a wonderful feeling then when they decided to do the movie. That's awesome. Well, thank you all for being here, for taking an hour out of your day to do this. Um, thank you all for tuning in and for submitting your questions. Sorry we weren't able to get through every single one of them. But yeah, stay tuned for more. We're planning more of these in the next coming weeks. So Fantastic. Yeah, if you're not well, we loved, we loved doing it. We Absolutely. loved participating. Yeah. It's a real pleasure and just good luck to everybody out there. You bet. Keep writing. This is a good time to keep writing. It, <laughs> perfect time. It's a muscle. The more you exercise it, the stronger it gets. Thank you. Thank Have you. a great night, everybody.